Good morning and welcome to Morning Movie News. Now, I don't know about you, but over the last few weeks I've become increasingly concerned about Big Hero 6 and whether or not it will be a success for Disney. After all, they don't want to come off as a one-hit wonder with Frozen. Now, of course, Tangled and Wreck-It Ralph were considered successes, but of course nowhere near uh, the success of Frozen. And they want to at least maintain a, a, a generous percentage of that success with Big Hero 6 instead of dipping way back down to where they were before, or perhaps even lower. And so where, what is the source of my concern? Well, a big thing came out yesterday, which I think just really made me feel like I was right on track to be concerned, uh, because Disney clearly is concerned as well. But first, let me show you the mind space I was in before this announcement came out from Disney. So on the first hand, I told you that friends of mine had described the trailer as cute. And a couple of you said, well, isn't cute a positive thing? And I think when you're trying to do a superhero, you know, uh, animated movie that's supposed to seem cool and exciting, you don't want it to be cute. I mean, think about Hiro Hamada. He is certainly a character of the age where he said, what do you think of my costume? And someone said cute, he would not be happy. So I think to uh, describe this film as cute is not the word that Disney or anyone involved with it would want to hear. Then when I put out the call for uh, videos for the BTT Voice episode for Big Hero 6, I had a couple of people write in, well actually you saw some videos said I don't know anything about Big Hero 6, but then I even had some people say I have not heard of this movie. I can't comment on it because I know nothing about it. To which I was like, what? Disney Animation and the publicity department, you have dropped the ball in that regard. Uh, and then also I feel the trailers themselves haven't gotten to the level that's necessary for a film that really honestly comes out in two weeks. Uh, Interstellar has done a fantastic job getting out in front of Big Hero 6. Tickets are already on sale. They've been selling quite a lot of them. Uh, and Big Hero 6 still doesn't have that amazing trailer that just crystallizes that it's a must-see. It hasn't, to me, jumped out of the kitty family all ages market uh, and into the, uh, you know, an animated movie for all time. Like, you have to see Big Hero 6. It's going to be something that people talk about forever. Right now, it looks like, oh yeah, that's that show that those kids like. That's what I think it's looking like. And so I'm, I'm concerned about the property itself. And also, you know, I have to say, unfortunately, in terms of diversity, despite the people always talking about it and wanting to see it from Disney, those films just don't do that well. Uh, Atlantis, Princess and the Frog, uh, Pocahontas, Mulan, all of these films have not been on the level of uh, their other, you know, unfortunately, Caucasian properties uh, in terms of not just box office, but merchandising. So it's very, very concerning. Emperor's New Groove as well. I mean, of course, there are pocket fan bases for all of these properties, but nothing like Frozen or Little Mermaid, etc. So Big Hero 6 is trying to be something new and exciting in a fusion of East and meets West, but it might look like audiences just simply don't want that, which is a whole nother disappointing conversation. So what's the, what's the announcement that made me concerned? Well, yesterday, Disney Animation said, forget 2018, we're moving Moana up to 2016. That's going to be our next movie from Disney Animation, and it's another princess movie. So to take a film that was supposed to have another two full years of uh, you know production and, uh, and post, uh, I'm not sure if they have post-production with an animated film, but you know, it's supposed to have that long to, to launch, to move it up this fast in front of other movies like Zootopia, etc., that we've discussed that are supposed to be in front of it in, in the pipeline for Disney animation, says to me that they're worried about Big Hero 6, and also they feel we just have to get another Disney princess up on the screen here. Now, is Moana a Disney princess that audiences will like? I feel that basically what you're looking at here is Atlantis meets Pocahontas. And two wrongs, I don't think you're going to make a right for Disney. I just think this, you know, it's been made very clear that when uh, Disney fans, Disney princess fans, want a specific kind of princess. She's got to have the ball gown. She, you know, she's got to do all the traditional aspects of royalty. Just being a princess in, you know, name and being the daughter of some, you know, chief or king just isn't enough. I mean, case in point, Pocahontas. You know, I watched that film the other day. Very good. Surprisingly sexy, though, for a film for uh, all ages and the children are supposed to enjoy. I was like... John Smith and Pocahontas just can't keep their hands off each other. Who animated this? You have to go, I'd say, cold showers for the entire animation team. But anyway, uh, I think that, you know, hopefully this will be something that's a, a little bit more family, I think family friendly. I think that might have hurt Pocahontas in the long run. Uh, but Mulan, totally great across the board, and I wish that film had, you know, done better box office wise, and it's, I wish it had sold more merchandise. Mulan's a great character, and that's a really great, highly stylized film. And this looks like it's going to be stylized. Uh, and also, the other thing that's great about it is it ties into Disney's multiple Hawaiian properties. Not only are they redoing the 
Polynesian Resort at the Walt Disney World property down in Orlando, one of the original hotels at that resort. Uh, really famous hotel, great resort, although there's a lot of controversy over taking out the middle atrium in the lobby, but that's a, that's a whole conversation for Disney World fans uh, like myself. Uh, but then also they have that resort uh, down in actual, in actual Hawaii. So having these characters for Moana will be a great way to promote those properties and have character meet and greets that tie into them. Uh, of course, Lilo, uh, Lilo and Stitch already does that. And then I would, I would like to point out, though, that that's really become a focus mainly on Stitch. And Lilo and her family are nowhere to be found, even though they were great characters. So you can see, you know, did Disney back away from promoting Lilo and her sister, etc.? Uh, or, you know, was there no demand for them? And so they just had to back off of that. If there's no demand for those characters, why would there be demand, demand for Moana? They also released a synopsis for the film. It's going to be a character at sea. Uh, she wants to fulfill um, you know, a quest of her people. And Moana goes, so she goes on a sailing adventure, kind of like Contiki. Uh, those are, that's the foreign film that got those uh, directors the Pirates 5 gig. But she not only goes on this quest, but she's joined by a demigod, uh, Maui. Uh, I guess like the island, uh, and I think that's uh, interesting if that will be a love interest or not. You know, uh, I guess what's better than a prince? How about a demigod? Although I guess that our Disney already has that with Hercules, another not incredibly popular property. So I think there are a lot of red flags here. I think that this is not probably the surefire hit that Disney Animation would like it to be, but I guess it's the best thing they've got in the pipeline that's anywhere near ready to go. But I'm curious to what you think. Is this a sign of con uh, concern for Big Hero 6? Also, it's more diversity, and I'm curious to know why you think uh, audiences, despite wanting more diversity in their live-action films, why it's still the Caucasian characters coming out of Disney are the most popular. You know, everybody wants to see, uh, I see all the time whenever I do a Disney princess video, where's the Latina Disney princess? Where's this? X, Y, Z. Uh, why isn't there more love for Pocahontas, for Tiana, Mulan? But then everybody just goes and sees Frozen instead of going and supporting these other properties. So I'm just curious to what you think of the whole situation and if Disney animation uh, is farther away from another Frozen-like hit than they might think. I think it might just be Frozen 2, and they should get started on that. All right, so the second story of the day also has to do with properties largely targeted at, you know, uh, girls and women. And it's very interesting because it's coming out of Hasbro. Now, as we all know, Hasbro makes movies. They're, they're very successful in that uh, regard with Transformers and G.I. Joe, and less so with Battleship. And Ouija, which is coming out this weekend, is also from Hasbro. It's a Hasbro game, and Hasbro Studios is behind it. Uh, so, But they've decided they want to start their own pr uh, production company so that they can make movies themselves that the studios aren't interested. So the properties they have with studios are, as I said, Transformers and G.I. Joe at Paramount. Uh, but Battleship obviously isn't going to move forward. Monopoly and Candyland are sewed up over at Sony. And then, of course, you have Ouija at Universal. Uh, so they've decided, though, that you, know, you might think to yourself, well, what's left there? And the answer would actually be uh, Hasbro's properties uh, and toys aimed at girls. Because there's an interesting story that ties into this that gives a lot of interesting perspective, and that's a report on their toy sales. And they saw tremendous growth with boys, 22% growth over in the Hasbro toy department, for thanks to the movies. Properties like, uh, let's see, I have the list here, Marvel toys, Star Wars, Transformers, all thanks to those uh, movies driving that the interest in those toys. So huge growth, 22%. So what was the growth over with the girls? It was just 5%. So I think Hasbro says, okay, movies are clearly what fuel our business, but none of the studios want to make movies out of our girl properties, our girl-based properties. So Hasbro says, why don't we just do it ourselves? Now, they're going to be a lot more low risk. Uh, clearly, they want to partner up with big, already established production companies and studios for the high-budget films like Transformers, etc. And Candyland, I guess. I would really love to see a Candyland movie, actually. Monopoly, that could be tough, but we'll see. If you can make the Lego movie work, I think anything can work with the right creative team behind it. So these are going to be less, you know, less expensive, so they're not so risky. But what are they doing? So anyway, the company is called All Spark Pictures. I think that's fantastic. It's a great nod to the Transformers films. Uh, even a casual fan like myself knows what they are. And I think it's a really funny choice. So All Spark Pictures is going to finance two movies. Now, one you already heard of, and that's Gem and the Holograms. That's coming out in 2015. It actually has like an October release, and that's with Jason Blum producing. He specializes in really inexpensive movies. And they have their G.I. Joe director, John Chu, helming it. And Scooter Braun, of course, who discovered Justin Bieber. Very clever, you know, group of talent behind the camera, very outside the box thinking. We'll see if it pays off. So Gem and the Holograms coming in 2015. Hasbro's making that movie themselves. And you can be sure there'll be a whole bunch of gem toys that they're like, 
don't you want to purchase these now, now that you've seen the movie? Let's see if they really, if it's that easy, you just have to make the movie. But then the other one that was announced yesterday, which makes this a story for today's episode, is a My Little Pony movie. Now, they already had, uh, you know, Equestria Girls, and where the ponies became actual, like, human beings through, like, a mirror, and they've done, they have another direct-to-video movie coming out. But they're going to do another film, uh, which is going to be a pure theatrical release coming from the My Little Pony team. Although they have brought in some like young adult author to write it who has never worked in Hollywood before and seems like a very odd choice. And they haven't said if it'll be anima if it'll be animated, whether it'll be hand drawn or CGI, and then also of course maybe it'll be live action. Who knows? Maybe Equestria Girls will be live action kind of like Gem. I guess we'll see how successful Gem is because My Little Pony doesn't come out until 2017. So uh, that gives them some time to, you know, test the water. So I'm curious to what you guys think. Is Hasbro right? Do you just have to make the movie and they will buy the toys? And what do you think of them having to do these girl movies themselves that no other Hollywood studio is interested in teaming up with them? I'm sure they'll get a distributor. They can't distribute the movies themselves, but nobody wants to make these films from a production standpoint. I think that's fascinating, and we'll see if Hasbro can turn around their girl division. Although maybe the girls are buying the guy toys. Who knows? I mean, how can you say that Star Wars is just for boys, right? I think the toy market continues to be a very frustrating place. We had that whole discussion about Gamora and a lack of Gamora toys. Um, the toy market just is very antiquated in terms of the toys I think it makes. Uh, and then, of course, also its view of the audience that it's selling those toys to. But anyway, that's the second story of the day. Now, the third story of the day has to do with something I tweeted out on Sunday about Avengers uh, and Robert Downey Jr. And someone said, oh, Grace, you make it so hard to be a Marvel fan when you talk about Robert Downey Jr. this way. And I just wanted to address the story again, give you a little bit of an idea of where I'm coming from and my perspective of it, and why I think it's important to discuss this. You know, someone might be like, just let it go from, you know, from Frozen, just a page from Elsa's playbook, let it go. Marvel, Marvel and Robert Downey Jr. love each other, let them be happy. But I think that, you know, what they're starting to do is verging a little bit on insulting to the rest of us, including those who make the event Marvel movies and those of us who watch them. So what's the story? Well, I tweeted this story from The Hollywood Reporter, and I said, basically, it's, it's official, Marvel is RDJ's, you know, biatch. I'm, I'm censoring it for those of you. I, I put a star, a star in it when I tweeted it. But the story was is that Robert Downey Jr. was on set for Avengers out in the UK, and he saw this 30-foot tall A they'd built, you know, to go on uh, just Avengers Tower. And he looked at it and he said, "I'd like to have that for my office. I need that for my office in Venice, California." And uh, he says he was just joking. I think he's trying to maybe put a good spin on it. But anyway, he says, "Oh, lo and behold, a couple of weeks later, uh, what pulls up to my office in California?" but a, a giant, you know, flatbed truck with this Avengers A on it. And they gave it to me! And so now it's going to go up on my office. Uh, and I think he wanted to show that as a fun story, and Marvel being like, oh, aren't we great? We just gave Robert Downey Jr. what he wanted. But I felt it was really insulting, and, for, and also, you know, stupid on the part of Disney for uh, one very big reason, which I'll get to in a moment. But let me just say that the reason I think it's uh, insulting to the people who make the Avengers, who made the Avengers is that, you know, Robert Downey Jr. doesn't, like, set up this camera himself and write the script and do all the publicity and do everything himself. A lot of people make the Avengers film and all of these films and the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And I'm sure maybe they'd like the A. So the fact that it just goes to Robert Downey Jr., I think is pretty insulting. And also the fact that he could just, as a whim, make a joke about it and he would get it, it creates a sense of tension on the set that I just don't think that you need. And it's like saying, hey, do I have to go around with post-its and stick it on everything that I want before Robert Downey Jr. scoops it up and who knew things were up for grabs in the first place? Silly me. I thought we were going to save all this stuff so the public could enjoy it and we could save it for posterity for the studio. So that's the, the other regard. Also, some people brought up that Warner Brothers would not let Ben Affleck have a Batman costume. They said he could take it, but they would charge him a hundred grand. But I think that's a different situation because they don't know how he's going to perform as Batman yet. If he makes two movies for Warner Brothers that make over a billion dollars, I'm sure he'll let him take home a bat suit, and probably even more. Considering what Robert Downey Jr. is getting, I'd try for the Batmobile. But anyway, so I think that you know, it's insulting to everybody else who maybe would like the A. It, it makes it seem like they didn't contribute anything. Then there's the posterity issue. Uh, it's wonderful to go visit the, stu uh, the studios out in Hollywood because they have a lot of their uh, the props and set pieces on display for you to see from these famous movies. So shouldn't the A go like on the side of one of the, uh, you know, the, st the sound stages on the Disney lot? Uh, wouldn't that be a really nice thing for the whole company to feel proud of that they made that? They're the Avengers. They assembled to make the movie. I think that would be a much better use of the A. Or why not put it in the theme parks so that everyone who paid for those movies, you know, Robert Downey Jr. might have been the bait, but the money didn't come from him, came from all of us. 
wouldn't it be great if we could enjoy the A at one of the theme parks? So I think there's that. But I'd also like to point out that that A, that Avengers A, now sits on the side of a building for Robert Downey Jr. where he produces movies for Warner Brothers because that's who he has a first look deal with for Team Downey, the company that works out of that office. So I just hope that Bob Iger and Kevin Feige are thinking about that, that whenever Robert Downey Jr. looks out at his Avengers A and thinks of a movie idea, he calls up Kevin Sujihara. All right, so that's the third story of the day. Now, for the viewer question, I thought this was a very good one. It might seem a little too specific, but I think it applies to everyone. And this comes from Niall Cochran. And Niall says, hey, Grace, so I have a question. Okay, because I found out that I have a new love for movies and theater. Excellent. Congratulations on discovering that. And I know I want to work in the business. Uh, there is a movie studio, uh, Quixote Studios, in my city right outside of New Orleans. And I was wondering if there was any positions in a movie studio that I can apply to or ask for with no experience. I have no idea what I want to do in the film industry, but I just want to get my foot in the door. Thanks for answering my question. I love all your channels. And I have a few more questions that you can hopefully answer. Maybe someday, Niall, I shall. But thank you again, Niall Jordan. All right, so that's Niall, Niall's full name. And so Niall obviously lives in New Orleans, and Quixote Studios is a place he'd like to work. All right, so I'm going to give you some advice on what to do here. And I think this kind of applies to everyone whenever you're trying to get your foot in the door, as you so eloquently said. I've never heard of Quixote Studios. I'd be curious to know what they make. But considering the fact I haven't heard of them, I think they'd be pretty low down the totem pole. So don't let them phase you, Niall. Don't let them think that you're trying to go up to Warner Brothers or Paramount and asking for a job. This is a small local studio, so they should be a little bit open to people inquiring about, you know, positions for work. So don't let them try and, you know, freeze you out or act too cool for school. All right. And also, I would tell you, Familiar, familiarize yourself with Quixote Studios. What do they make? Uh, how long have they been there? What kind of productions go on there? So that when you do get to talk to someone, you look like you know what you're doing. So that's the first thing, preparation. Second of all, persistence. You must per be persistent. At first, they're going to think you're just you're like, you know, I'd love to work on a movie set. It's a whim. You know, I'm going to not be a reliable employee. So you need to show that you are a reliable employee. Now, it's a very fine line between showing that you're a reliable, dependable person and being a weirdo stalker. So make sure you're very aware of how you're coming across. I would go up, introduce myself, see if you can make a call. I wouldn't, I would call first before actually showing up because uh, showing up actually kind of freaks people out. They're like, oh my gosh, you're in my personal space. I didn't invite you. So I think, or just, you know, you could drop off a resume and then make it clear that you plan to leave as soon as you do so. That's something you could do. And then I would follow up every, you know, two weeks or so. You know, not initially. First, you always follow up the next day or two days later on your initial contact. But then give about two to two weeks in between uh, calls so that, you know, they know that you're, you're reliable, that you can keep tabs on something, that you're not, you know, like a crazed person that they have to worry about having around. Then I would say, let it be clear that you're willing to do anything. On a film set, since it's production, there's always something that needs to be carried, something that needs to be watched, something that needs to be kept track of. There's always a way you can get in to do that. So just make it clear that you want to do anything, you just want to contribute, uh, and no job is too small, too dirty, too inconsequ inconsequential. Just explain to them as you did to me. You want to work in the business and you're not quite sure where and you'd like to get some on-set experience. Um, and it sounds like if you're in school, you could go the internship route. If you're not in school, it gets trickier because, you know, I think the person doesn't want to accept responsibility for you financially. You might say, I'm willing to work for nothing, but at the same time, you know, eventually that's going to be probably going to be a decision you regret. So I think it's very hard for people to take someone on with no pay who's not in school. If you aren't in school, I suggest you make it clear that you are employed to the point where you can support yourself and this is something you want to do on the side on your off days uh, so that they don't have to feel like, hey, you know, I'm responsible. I'm taking on the responsibility for this person's uh, livelihood and their quality of life. Any good quality place should feel that way. If they don't, then you should be somewhat concerned. But I hope that's help helpful for you, Niall. Put together some kind of resume. Uh, be very polite and professional, persistent, and patient. Uh, all the P's. Make sure you just keep all that in mind. And I think that you have a very good shot of getting some kind of job on the set. Good luck. Let me know how it turns out. Let us all know. Uh, we'll be rooting for you. All right. Thank you so much to everybody for tuning in to today's episode. Please write down below what you think of today's top three stories and the viewer question. Anything you'd like to see covered tomorrow and any questions that you might have. Thanks for watching. Bye.